Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you, uh, Marie Money, for inviting me back to be here in uh, Shanghai. It's great to be here since uh, last time I was here was Marie Money 2019, so it's, uh, it's nice to be back. So, yes, yeah, so my, my presentation today, I'm going to be talking about the reopening of China and the impact on shipping demand. However, However, before I sort of get into the weeds and the details on the shipping demand, I thought it may be worth, as I'm one of the first speakers of the day, just giving you a, a relative health check on the shipping markets, just to show where we think they currently are at MSI. We've just had a very good uh, presentation on the macroeconomic environment. I'm not going to spend too long on this slide. Needless to say that the global economy is growing, but perhaps at a moderate rate. Here in China, We've seen a bounce back uh, following uh, the abolition of lockdown. However, the real estate sector is suffering. And certainly for the dry bulk market, the real estate market is a very, very important sector for demand. So bear that in mind as we go through the presentation. What I wanted to put up first from a shipping perspective is just to give you an overview of demand. Uh, and what we have here is just a simple chart showing you commodity demand uh, in 2022, 23, and 24, uh, along with a historical average. Now, as we can see in 2023, the yellow bars, we've seen relatively strong demand growth across most shipping sectors, especially across the energy sectors, the, the sectors typically towards the top, the gas sectors, LNG, LPG, crude and product tankers. Where we've seen weakness has been in the more on the container ships and perhaps dry bulk. If we look forward to 2024, again, strong demand growth territory at or above historical levels. So a positive picture overall for the demand side of the shipping industry. Now, the other side of the fundamentals equation is, of course, supply. And here, depending on which sector you put on the microscope, will depict on whether you see the supply side being a positive to fundamentals or a negative. The chart on the le left shows the order book as it stood at the end of 2019, and then as it stood at the end of Q3 this year. What we can see for three sectors in particular, the container ships, LNG, and car carriers, we've seen a huge increase in the order book over the course of the last two to three years. The LNG sector now, the order book there, it represents 50% uh, of those vessels currently on the water is represented by those vessels on the order book. So huge volumes of LNG vessels to be delivered over the next three to four years. For dry bulk, for the tanker sectors, the order books remain relatively depressed. Very low indeed for something like the crude tanker sector. The order book is only around 3% of those vessels uh, currently trading in the fleet. Now, of course, the supply side does have a safety release valve in the way of scrapping and demolishing vessels, removing tonnage from the system. And as we can see on the chart on the right, we're now seeing an increasing number of vessels reaching what we would deem to be scrapping age. The average age of the fleet now, overall, if you take it on vessel numbers, is around 17 years old. We're seeing dry bulk vessels, we're seeing tanker vessels, all creeping in on average into their teenage years. So we do expect to see a lot more scrapping around the corner, especially with some of the market developments, but also with tightening regulations. So where are we currently on the earnings cycle? Uh, this is just a simple insta uh, pictogram to try and distinguish where each sector is on the relative, its relative cycle, its earnings cycle, and how they compare against one another. Now, if we start on the left-hand side of the slide, what we can see there are sectors that have come off the top of the markets, but typically are remaining relatively strong. The fundamentals remain relatively robust. So here we have a lot of the energy sectors, the oil tankers, the gas sectors. If we move further to the right, we can see things like the container ship sector, the dry bulk sector. They've come off the, the highs that we saw 18, 24 months ago. We do expect there to be another six, 12 months of downward pressure in these markets, 
before we expect to see them turn. Moving up further to the right, we've got the offshore market. The offshore sector has benefited uh, over the course of the last 18 months with higher oil prices. We expect to see further runway on earnings for the offshore sector. And currently at the top of the pile is LPG, and more specifically the VLGC sector, which has benefited from inefficiencies through places like the Panama Canal, but also very recently a lot of propane being uh, imported into China to feed PDH plants. Shipping as an industry remains relatively profitable across most sectors, uh, as we can see on the chart here, apart from currently, I would say, dry bulk. What I've displayed on the chart here is the break-even levels. That is the, the debt service, which is represented by the dark blue bar, the, the daily OPEX, which is the uh, yellow part of the bar. So that's your break-even. Uh, the red line indicates the one-year TC rate, the earnings. Therefore, any white between the, the bar and the red line indicates there's profit in the system to pay shareholders, to pay dividends, or to make further investments. You will see that on dry bulk, there isn't really a gap between the red line and the bar. And when it comes to asset values, I would say across the board, asset values across shipping remain relatively sticky. Uh, at the top, we have uh, an example of a product tanker and a crude carrier, and we can see here that values are up or above uh, all historical averages that we've seen in recent years. So very strong tanker markets currently. At the bottom, we have the dry bulk and the container ship markets. Now, although we've seen earnings collapse from the levels that we, certainly on the, in the container ship sector side, collapse from the levels that we saw 18 months ago, uh, values are still at sort of historical levels. They haven't collapsed uh, in tandem. So I would say values remain relatively robust. So moving on more onto the, the sort of China demand uh, question. Uh, before I get into sort of what's going on sort of now, I just wanted to show two slides just to make sure that we're not sort of just taking the last two or three years into, in isolation, we try and put that in perspective. And the reason I want to do that is because demand for shipping, demand for commodities into China or out of China, I think has been evolving over some time. Uh, I've put four simple charts up here to try and show that as the Chinese economy changes, we would expect to see a slowdown in some of the imports in terms like raw commodities. And that's what I've tried to depict on this chart. So at the top, we've got uh, Chinese residential properties sold. Uh, we've seen a slowing of that over the course of the last few years. On the top right, we've got iron ore imports and steel output. It's very clear there to see there's a trend uh, on the downward slope. Uh, bottom left, we've got refinery capacity. We saw some big numbers in the first uh, decade or so of the century. That again has slowed. And uh, the bottom right-hand side just shows you the Chinese uh, share of uh, exports as a share of GDP. Again, we've seen that slow and sort of uh, level off at sort of more manageable levels. On the energy side, the interesting development has been that China has now become the number one player in terms of energy consumption. Uh, we can see this very simple infographic that shows who were the big energy uh, consumers at the start of the century versus uh, where they stand today. And we can see that China has gone from third position in 2000 to number one position over the course of the last 23 years. All of these factors are going to be impacting demands for ships. So moving on to what we've seen more recently and also what we expect to see over the next couple of years, uh, I thought I would start off with dry bulk. I mean, the Chinese market is such an important market for the dry bulk sector. Around 45% of all dry bulk commodities end up in China. And this chart just shows Chinese dry bulk imports year on year uh, since uh, 2014. We can see that the COVID years, uh, certainly in 2021, we saw a drop year on year in dry bulk commodity imports into China. But since then, we've seen growth. Now, what is most surprising here is, is the rate of growth that we saw in, uh, in 2023, this year. 
Remember that we haven't seen that strength in the, the real estate market. Typically, that has driven the dry bulk market uh, over time. We've not seen that this year. However, dry bulk imports have been nearly at double-digit territory. Why is that? Well, it's not been due to the iron ore markets. Uh, these two charts just try and depict what's been going on iron ore at a very headline level. We can see that if we look at uh, the profitability of the steel market here in China for rebar and hot roll rolled coil, there really hasn't been much in the way of profitability. Uh, commodity prices have been relatively high, demand has been low, therefore profit has been marginal, uh, if, if best, uh, and in some cases steel mills have been uh, losing money. On the right, we can see steel output. A lot of the dry bulk analysts, uh, certainly in Europe, were expecting to see a, a rebound, a huge rebound uh, in Q1 this year, leading into Q2 in terms of steel output. We started seeing that uh, during the first couple of months of the year. It didn't carry on materializing after the uh, lunar new year. And we can see that 2023 steel output is if anything, down on last year. So it's not been the iron ore, it's not been the steel market that's been driving that, that stellar dry bulk uh, uh, commodity imports over the course of the last 12 months. This chart basically gives away where all of that new demand has come from. Uh, it's a very stark chart. Uh, where all of that new demand has come from this year into China has been from coal. Uh, 100, over 120 million tonnes of additional coal has been imported into China this year. That makes everything else look insignificant. Iron ore, uh, steel, uh, grains, minor bulks, into any other region, into any other country. So coal has been the big driver of dry bulk commodity demand into China in 2023. Why is that? Well, one of the primary reasons has been related to the weather. Uh, we saw significant droughts and uh, a lack of hydro production of electricity here in China during the summer months. And we can see on the chart on the left here uh, just how uh, hydro was cut during the, the summer months and how that was displaced with coal production of energy, of electricity. So a lot of coal was being imported into China from an energy security standpoint and to basically keep electricity uh, volumes uh, and quantities at levels that were required to maintain the economy. Now, if anything, the imports were uh, overcooked. If we look on the chart on the right, that just shows you the build-up in coal stockpiles. We can see now that uh, stockpiles of uh, thermal coal here in China are over 5 million tonnes. Uh, historically, uh, the most we've seen is around three million, uh, 300 million tonnes. So we've got about 200 million tonnes excess of coal now that has to be worked out, has to be burnt off uh, from the stockpiles that are now existing here in China. Uh, looking a little bit further, I thought I would throw in a few more structural changes into uh, the demand side here in China. The first one on the dry bulk side I just wanted to highlight was the, the rate of uh, industrialization and urbanization. The chart on the left uh, depicts uh, in five-year blocks the uh, urbanization rate here in China. And as you can see, currently we're looking at around 68% urbanization in China. Now, that can't continue to grow indefinitely. Uh, I think the, the government aims is to reach around 78% by 2035-2036. So that, in a sense, will have a, a, a meaningful impact on the dry bulk market as those sort of numbers, as those percentages begin to be uh, hit. Also on the right-hand side is another structural change. And this is the structural change whereby uh, steel is produced by electric arc furnace production rather than through BOF production. What that means is that you use uh, scrap steel, you use electricity and you use a lot less coal, you use a lot less iron ore. E EAF production of steel is a lot better for the environment. Emissions are a lot lower, especially if you can use green electricity during this process. And as you can see, we're expecting quite a big take-up 
in EAF production of steel over the coming, over the coming years. This, again, will have an impact on the dry bulk markets. Moving on to the oil side. Now, this is certainly a sector where we have seen a very strong rebound uh, post-COVID here in China. As we can see from the yellow bar, again, a very stark sort of in isolation. We're seeing almost 10% growth in crude oil imports into China during 2023. You'll notice in 2024, things fall off again. So this is sort of a one-time hit sort of playing catch up with where we were pre-COVID, and then we expect sort of more normality to return closer to around 2% year-on-year growth. Another interesting thing is that China has now become by far the most significant importer of crude volumes. We can see it used to be the US, but now that uh, mantle has been very firmly taken by China. Oh, sorry. One of the things that dictates where oil flows is, of course, refineries. Uh, that will dictate where crude comes into and where products come out, and also what goes on in th with things like domestic consumption of uh, refined products. Now, in China, we've seen uh, a concerted build-up in refineries as the China tries to become more and more self-sufficient and try to capitalize on those higher-grade, higher-value commodities. lost my slide. <coughs> but as we can see, uh, the growth in Chinese refineries we do think will start slowing down. Refineries will start moving. The growth will start moving to the Middle East, will start moving to India, will start moving to Africa. However, I think there is, again, another structural change that we're seeing within the market. The chart on the right helps depict this. We will now see, by 2028, we will see more refineries, more oil refinery capacity east of the Suez than there is west of the Suez. So as Europe, as North America closes down refineries, we're seeing a build-up uh, in the east. This is going to impact uh, trade flows, the demand for uh, VLCCs predominantly, and also we will expect to see more product flows coming out of Asia, heading to places like Europe and to North America, which will be good for ton miles and good for the tanker markets. And that's a point I just wanted to, to sort of hit home with, with one slide on the, the difference between cargo movements, ton miles, and shipping demand. And this is something that has really uh, has come home in the course of the last two or three years during COVID, because if you start looking at the movement of cargoes in tons terms, just tons of cargo moving from A to B, you don't always really get an appreciation for how, many, how much shipping you need to move that cargo. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, let, let's just take one of these, and I'll just have to look at the chart for this one. Let's just take one uh, sector one year in isolation to prove a point. So let's look at 2021 for the dry bulk markets, which was a, a relatively strong year. We saw trade growth of 3%. If we factor in ton miles, so how the distance that the cargo has to move, the dry bulk cargo has to move, we actually saw a year-on-year -year growth of 3.5%. Now, if we then factor in not only distance, but speed, port waiting times, route deviation due to crew changes, uh, quarantining time, and how, many, how much shipping we actually need to service that 3% that growth in the tonnage terms, you can see we actually needed to see an 8% growth in shipping demand in 2021 to service that 3% growth in actual tonnage terms. We've seen something similar on the ton mile impact for the, for the oil tanker markets this year. We can see actually uh, trade, uh, trade tons have only grown by about 2% this year, but in terms of ton mile, they've grown by 8%, as a lot more volumes have been leaving places like the Middle East, to, the, to service the, the Russian volumes that have been lost in places like Europe. We've seen a lot further ton miles. We're seeing a lot more oil move further distances on the water. That has a big impact for the shipping markets. Moving on to the container markets, uh, if we look at the top 10 uh, exports, uh, exporting ports uh, from the container ship sector here in, in China, we can see that 2023 has been a, a strong year for container ship uh, box exports. 
uh, higher than any year over the last six or so years. As we heard a little bit about in the previous presentation, one thing that we have seen is that on the Far East US trade, China's dominance has uh, gone from around taking around 70% of that trans-Pacific trade to around 60% of that trade. Now that started originally with the, the Trump tariffs uh, that were started in 2018 and 2019, but we're seeing that momentum continue. And as we heard a little bit uh, previously, some of those volumes have been uh, displaced by other regional players. So, Although China has come down by 10%, we've seen places like Thailand, Vietnam, and, Indone uh, and India sorry, go up by 20, 30, and 40%. So we're seeing uh, some elasticity in supply chains and increasingly uh, further uh, potential work for the container ship market as we're moving boxes between assembly points across the supply chain. Also in Mexico, we're seeing increasing volumes being moved from Mexico into the US. We're also seeing increasing volumes from China to Mexico. So a lot of the production has now taken place in Mexico rather than here in China. When it comes to LNG, LNG itself has, a, had, a, has had a very interesting story over the course of the last two years or so. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine last year, uh, Europe was... Uh, didn't have much option to buy, rather than to buy any LNG it could get its hands on, regardless of price. Uh, that meant that less LNG came here to China last year, and a lot more was redirected to the European markets. Now, Europe has sort of sated its appetite for LNG. It's re uh, replenished a lot of its stocks. But we, interestingly enough, if you look at 2023, we haven't seen the sort of rebound of LNG into China to the same levels that we saw in 2021. The other also interesting development is now that the LNG that's servicing the, the Chinese demand isn't coming from America. A lot of it was coming from America in the past. That American LNG is now going to Europe, which is a relatively short distance. Uh, China is now getting a lot more of its LNG from the Middle East. So that's having a negative impact on the LNG market. And my final point on demand is that basically we are seeing a very rapidly changing energy landscape globally and especially here in China. And this is taken from our energy model and we can see how the, uh, the energy landscape in China looks as we move out to 2050 the advent of more and more in terms of renewables, the less demand there will be for coal and oil. Now, this will obviously present some opportunities for some shipping sectors and will be disadvantaged for others. But it is a space that is evolving quite quickly and one that we're having to analyse and convert into what that actually means from a shipping perspective, what vessel types, what cargo routes, what can we expect for the shipping industry given the backdrop of the changing energy landscape. So I just wanted to finish up with uh, just a handful of slides on uh, the supply side, shipyards and second-hand values. The first one I wanted to say was contracting has been very strong. Contracting for ships has been very strong over the last few years, primarily driven by container ship and the gas carrier markets. Now, that has been advantageous to the Chinese yards. We've seen a build-up uh, in experience at the Chinese yards. We've also seen the reopening of uh, some yards that were previously mothballed, given the profitability of shipyards has now gone back into the black, where it sat in the red for a number of years. So we've seen elasticity in shipyard capacity. The other benefit to China is China has, has captured around 50% of all orders over the course of the last 18 months for dual-fueled vessels. It's by far the, the, been the most successful of all the ship, shipbuilding nations in terms of capturing these new technologies and these new, new contracts. And this, this puts the, the Chinese yards in a very good position going forward. If we look to the chart on the right, which is our MSI forecast for uh, alternative fuels and green fuels as we move forward out to the middle of the middle of the century. We can see we expect to see more and more methanol and ultimately more ammonia, more hydrogen-powered vessels 
being uh, contracted. And the fact that China has already got a track record, has already captured 50% of that market, stands it in very good stead as we move forward into the next decade. We do expect to see new building prices fall off, however, over the, in about 12 months' time, as a lot of the, uh, the shipyards deliver the tonnage, as we don't see any new contracting coming, well, as we don't see the significant volumes of contracting coming back on stream until the sort of second half of this decade, we do expect to see new building prices fall off uh, alongside with cost, downward cost pressure. So we expect to see new building prices in 2024, 2025 fall from today's level, which will be some comfort for those that are looking to order tonnage. But as we look further out, we do expect to see earnings relatively positive, I would say. This is just a, a simple box and whisker plot, which shows you the historical distribution of earnings uh, alongside our view of the current earnings, which is the red dot, and the green dot is our view of earnings in 2027. Now, even if the green dot is below the red dot, the positive to take from this slide is that the, the earnings in 2027 will be at or above historical levels, pretty much for all sectors bar the container ship sector. But the container ship sector itself, if you look over, over history, has evolved very quickly. It's now a mature industry, I would say, in shipping, whereas some of these data are taken when it was... Uh, a developing sector within shipping from, from in, the early, in the 90s and the early 2000s. So for my last slide, because it's a marine money conference, I thought I would just put up uh, where are currently the best investments within the shipping spectrum. Uh, and for this simple exercise, what I've done is utilize the MSI models. I've assumed that you've got 40 million US dollars burning a hole in your back pocket and you want to go and invest it in shipping. Just a pure cash play, no leveraging. You're just going to go and what can you buy and what returns can you expect if you hold on to that asset until 2027 and sell it. So you can see at the, the top of the pile, we have the offshore markets. Uh, still going great guns. We think there's some earnings uh, upside still left in the system. Very little away in the order book and you can expect some sort of high teen returns from an IRR perspective. The tanker sector, you can probably just squeeze out double digit returns. Uh, and as I say, we still think there's some stickiness in the, 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 the bulk of sector, so they are relatively overpriced currently, so you're not gonna make huge returns. And the container ship sector, that looming order book we think is going to have an impact on the market, at least for the next two, three years. So thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. I will be around if anybody has any questions later on today. Thank you.